Um, I didn't really know where to start with this. I've been doing a lot of work on, on these issues this year and written thousands of PowerPoint slides on them, probably literally. Uh, but I think it comes down to whenever pretty much any conversation we have about beer and pubs, uh, you get this, uh, this weird dichotomy. Uh, you, you have one of two conversations, depending on who you're speaking to. Uh, either the left-hand side of this chart, which is there's never been a better time to be a beer drinker. Uh, we've got four times as many breweries now as we had uh, 18 years ago. Uh, unprecedented array of style and, and flavour in beer. Uh, and the mainstreaming of, of, of interesting beer. Uh, the fact that IPA is now a recognised style alongside lager or, or Guinness or Stout or whatever people choose to call it. The fact that it's much easier now for, to get beer coverage in mainstream media than it ever was. And on the left hand side, almost the opposite picture, 21 pubs closing every week, uh, we've got, we're su suffering a long term decline in, in beer volume, uh, cask ale is in double digit decline and has been for about four years now, and that decline is accelerating and getting worse, uh, and a massive consolidation in brewery ownership, so that one brewer now controls a third of the entire planet's uh, beer output. So you cover up whichever side of that slide you like and get either an incredibly optimistic or an incredibly pessimistic picture, um, both of them are true. Uh, so it's a really unusual time. I think it's, it's probably a better time to be a beer drinker than it is to be a beer brewer or, or pub owner. I, th I, think, I think it's safe to say. Um, so it's it kind of when I'm writing, it depends on which hat I've got on, whether I'm writing trade or consumer, as to whether it's happy or sad, really. Um, what I want to do now, uh, I thought I've, I've, some of the work I've been doing this year is on trends uh, and I've got some stuff on macro trends that are informing the beer market uh, and then some stuff on how that's creating trends within the beer market. Uh, now I'll move on from that to talk a little bit about uh, Cascale and craft beer uh, before talking to you about the information you've given us uh, about beer cities and then try and wrap all this up into something that makes sense. So, uh, some societal trends. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, changing things happening in society that are, that are driving some of the things that we had uh, on that first slide. Uh, the first trend I've called touchy-feely, which is um, w when you look at social trends, and my background is in advertising, and certainly one agency, uh, our USP, was looking at social trends and trying to divine where the future is going to go. Uh, you've always got to come up with a smart-ass headline when you kind of identify a social trend. Also, what I realised when I was doing a lot of that kind of work is that trends come in pairs. If there's, if, there's, if there's one thing happening, if there's one trend that you're spotting in society, the counter trend is going to be there somewhere or it's just around the corner. So as we all know, the thing about this trend is uh, we're spending more and more time on screens. Social media, the internet have absolutely changed the way we live every single aspect of our lives. Uh, the average person spends something like uh, four hours a day looking at some kind of screen or another. Uh, that means there's a counter trend. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're rejecting uh, screens, it doesn't mean that we're, we're kind of throwing our iPhones away, but the more time we spend on screen, the more we feel the need to reconnect with something real and something tangible. And we're seeing a lot of uh, examples of that that kind of add up. We need to reconnect with the real world. So some things I've put on here, uh, I've put this book up, The Shepherd's Life. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was top of the uh, bestseller, uh, non-fiction bestseller charts, both as hardback and paperback. This guy who's uh, a shepherd in the Lake District realised that he uh, was doing the same job as his dad, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, uh, and wrote a memoir about being a shepherd in the Lake District, sold hundreds of thousands of copies in the UK. Uh, means a lot to me because my agent got his first ever number one out of this, and after working with him for 10 years, I finally saw him smile, uh, which, was, which was really nice. But if you, if you, go, into, if you go to Waterstones now, there's an entire section, usually kind of two bays of books, which have got the title Natural History. And there's, I, I call it the bees and trees uh, category. Um, it's, it's about uh, nature, it's about reconnecting with nature. This category did not exist in bookshops 10 years ago. Now, these books are H's for Hawk. Um, mm -hmm. And, and books like that, the, 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 this, there's this need to kind of, if we can't get back out into nature ourselves, we're going to read about it and do it vicariously. Um, I've put this, the ingredients of this sandwich here. This is a, a, a thing I read about earlier this year. Uh, a, a French 30-year-old filmmaker uh, decided to, to make his own sandwich, by which I mean he uh, grew the wheat to bake the bread. Uh, he got a cow and churned the milk uh, for butter. He planted a roof garden and grew his vegetables. He went out fishing and caught the tuna. It took him 10 months to make this sandwich. 
uh, and his conclusion after he did that, he made a film about it, his conclusion was, my generation don't have enough to do with their hands. You know, they, 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 there's this, there is this need to kind of touch something, something real. Um, and we've been to a food festival recently, uh, food and drink festival. Lots and lots of sessions on carving your own wooden spoons. <laughs> Again, if you go back into Waterstones, there are books on how to carve your own wooden spoons. Uh, I went to a food festival in Ireland last year, and people saying the best session was the guy talking about carving wooden spoons. Again, a lot of us aren't going to do it, but we like the idea that we might do it, because it's just something. We want to whittle uh, <laughs> instead of just pressing buttons. And bullet journals. I've got my bullet journal on the back there. People buying these kind of Lycansturm notebooks, and, and it's kind of a combination of a to-do list and mindfulness, where you draw, you draw your own calendars, you design your own schedule. Uh, if you go on Instagram, people are posting pictures of their bullet journal pages, where you can see this beautifully calligraphied to-do list that's obviously taken about an hour to create, and on that to-do list it says, pick up dry cleaning, do shopping. <laughs> so it takes someone an hour to create that list, uh, when they could have just done the tasks. But these are all examples of people trying to kind of reconnect with something physical, something tangible, and I think that does have effects on, on, on what we're talking about here. Next I've got redefining Englishness. Uh, are we resolving our national identity crisis or is it getting worse? Obviously Brexit is a, a huge thing in this, but what it means to be English and what it means to be British are under great scrutiny. Uh, one of the big internet memes this year uh, has been uh, the identification of, of gammons, <laughs> red-faced racists, uh, men of a certain age uh, talking about how it's, the, the political correctness has gone mad, you can't even demean women of people of colour anymore, what's the world coming to? Um, and, uh, and at the same time that's happening, we had the World Cup where bef before, the, before the World Cup started, newspapers were carrying cartoons like uh, the England coach in the short stay car park at Heathrow and, and things like that. And then suddenly we get to the semi-finals and we rediscover a way of being proud to be English again, uh, but Southgate very publicly saying this is a new kind of Englishness, this is a multicultural Englishness, this is about diversity and inclusiveness. So there's a big debate going on there uh, about, I guess, reclaiming Englishness, redefining Englishness or Britishness uh, within this kind of devolved context and what Brexit's going to mean for that. And from a beer point of view, uh, I think even a lot of Brexit voters would, would uh, rankle at being sort of compared to Nigel Farage. <laughs> what drink do you associate with Nigel Farage? We've got a problem there. Uh, safe at home. Um, we've got this long-term drift to home. The home is comfier than ever. You know, we, if you, uh, I would say when we're talking about pubs, if you compare a pub now to a pub 20 years ago, pretty much the same. If you compare your home now to your home 20 years ago, you've got an infinite number of TV channels, uh, on-demand services, high-speed internet, flat screen, plasma tellies covering one wall, and you can order in anything you want within minutes. Amazon will deliver your groceries within hours of ordering them. Uh, the pub is still the pub. You know, how does it keep up? And it's nice that the home is comfy than ever because I pick up a newspaper, go online, and we're being told that outside is just dreadful. Don't go outside, you're going to get killed, really, basically. Uh, and so this is all uh, sort of winding up to kind of keep people safe at home. And we see that uh, in the market. This is uh, the red line there is the percentage of total beer sales uh, in the off trade. And the blue line is the total percentage of beer sales in the on trade. So in 2000, just under 70% of beer, total beer was sold in the on trade. Uh, that's now down to less than 50. We now drink more beer at home than we do in pubs. Uh, overall, people are going to the pub quite a lot less than they did. This is a chat from last year's cask report, actually. Uh, would you say now that you visit pubs more or less often now compared to three years ago, or do you think it's about the same? 39% of people say it's about the same, uh, and 40% uh, of people say they're going either a little less often or much less often than they used to. If you go back 20 years, the average Brit went to the pub once a week. Now the average Brit goes to the pub once a month. Uh, this is kind of... Uh, a huge change in people's behaviour. And when you break that down, uh, there's, there's different factors that, uh, that influence that. You're not going to even be able to make any sense of this from halfway back down the room, but basically what this chart is showing is that when you get to 35, your pub going falls off a cliff. And when I did focus groups of the cask report this summer, people were going, yeah, as soon as we have kids, that's it. We don't go to the pub. And pub going only recovers when you're 55 plus, when your kids are grown up and, and they've left home. 
Uh, you can be a hipster because of your facial hair, your, your clothes that you wear, the fact that you ride a bike instead of driving a car, the fact that you drink craft beer, the fact that you have sourdough bread or avocado on toast. You know, it's, it's not about a, a fashion thing or a music thing, it's about anything you do in your life. Uh, and this is why craft beer is, is, is so successful. One of the reasons craft beer is so successful at the moment. I've noticed in North East London where I live, 10 years ago, people were wearing, uh, in the summer, cool hipsters were wearing band t-shirts. They also enjoy pointing out to them uh, that the band t-shirt that they're wearing was actually a band and not just a cool logo that they'd seen in <laughs> Topshop or whatever. Uh, now those people are wearing Beavertown t-shirts or, or pressure drop t-shirts ra rather than band t-shirts. Uh, and so this again has some kind of impact on, on what we're doing. And finally, and probably most importantly, the experience economy. People have been talking about this for years. We can now get whatever products we want uh, mail ordered to our door instantly. Buying products is not really as... I mean, we've all got more stuff than we actually need. Uh, we, we're all bored of buying stuff. Uh, decluttering is one of the biggest trends uh, in publishing and in kind of household stuff at the moment. We've got too much stuff. Uh, what do you buy someone for Christmas present, for their birthday present? Well, they've already got all the books and all the CDs and everything else that they want. I'll, I'll buy them an experience, I'll buy them a cooking um, course, or I'll buy them whatever. Um, we don't go out as much as we used to, we've established that. That means that when we do go out, it's got to be memorable, it's got to be really good. So what you see with those people only going to the pub once a month, is when they get to the pub, their standards are much higher and they're happy to pay six quid for a pint of craft beer or 10 quid for a cocktail because they're only doing it once a month. They're not doing it every night like you and I are. And, uh, and, and so this raises the standard, it raises the bar on everything that needs to happen. And going out needs to be a proper memorable experience and not just a routine thing anymore. And you can just see how everything that we're talking about today spins off, uh, off that one, probably more than any of the other trends I've highlighted. So in terms of how that's impacting the market a little bit, um, I think the, the, the traditional on-trade and off-trade are breaking down. Um, we've got, uh, in, in terms of off-trade, we've got websites, not just shops. Uh, we, we shouldn't just be thinking about supermarkets uh, and off-licenses anymore. We've got bottle shops, we've got websites. We've got, we've got the idea of someone like Magic Rock uh, buying beer off their website is interfacing with the brand. Uh, it, it's, it's having a relationship with them directly rather than just buying a can of beer from a, from a shopkeeper. <laughs> And tap rooms, uh, that's, the, that's the Moor Beer tap room down in Bristol. Uh, this one particularly struck me back in February uh, when I found myself on a Thursday afternoon sitting in a cold, freezing cold warehouse on an industrial estate in Bermondsey with 600 other people because it was Four Pure launching their new brewery. And people in coats and scarves are huddled up, freezing cold, underneath uh, warehouse shelving stacked high with uh, bales of hops and, and, and bags of malt. And you're thinking, this is shit awful place to drink beer. <laughs> but it's not about that, it's about, no, I'm here, I'm actually in Four Pure's brewery with the brewer doing brewery tours around there and stuff. Tap rooms, you know, the Bermondsey Mile, this, this is a real experience. Going back to that experience economy thing, it's not just about, uh, pubs and bars and shops anymore. Uh, my local hairdresser offers me a craft beer when I go, I mean, I, okay, I live in North London, but my local hairdresser offers me a craft beer when I go in there. There's food carts, there's festivals, uh, food and drink festivals, all sorts of different places and occasions now. Waitrose are putting bars into some of their biggest shops. Uh, Whole Foods are putting bars into some of their biggest shops, uh, blurring that on off trade uh, dimension. And of course we have to talk about craft beer. Uh, uh, People are still talking about the, what the definition of craft beer is. It doesn't matter whether craft beer has a definition or not. It's still the biggest thing to hit beer in a generation. Uh, it's redefining the entire market. It's reframing what people think of as premium and quality. Even if you're making Carlsberg, 4% Carlsberg, churning it out of Northampton, you have to redefine what your ideas of quality and premiumness are because even if people aren't going to drink craft beer, it's set a new standard in the market. And when you talk to people about what craft beer is, there never will be an agreed technical definition in this country. There just won't be. But if you ask people what characterises it, you get some incredibly consistent answers. Uh, the use of high quality ingredients, it takes more care, it's produced in small volumes, uh, human input, and not being owned by a large company. These are consistent what people could The other thing that's missing off here is local. It's produced locally, which gets tied up into the, into the small thing. So people know what it is, they can describe it, even if they can't define it. 
Uh, increasingly craft drinkers are choosing style first and brand later. Uh, we had uh, IPA, then we had sour beers, uh, and now we've got New England IPA. New England IPA is the opposite of what IPA was. Uh, IPA was a beer that was designed to age over long periods on long sea journeys. Uh, when it was reinvented as a new beer, it was about it being incredibly bitter. Uh, 10 years ago, people were boasting about the bitterness units in IPA going, well, this one's 100 bitterness units, this one's 120 bitterness units. IPA now is about being drunk fresh. You drink it within three weeks or it's no good. There's no bitterness. There's no bittering hops in a New England IPA. It's all about fruity, easy drinking. It's the opposite. What we now call an IPA is the opposite of what we used to call an IPA. Uh, so these styles are evolving incredibly quickly. And also new generations of drinkers uh, are adopting styles in order to redefine themselves against old people. If I go on social media and I slag off New England IPA as being a travesty of a beer style, any beer drinker, any beer Twitter under 30 goes, yes, fuck off old man. Because uh, these are people who came of age, these are people who reached legal drinking age after craft beer was a thing. They've never known the market that we grew up with where if you got a really decent tasting beer that was a novelty that was fantastic they've always had this choice and so I'm calling this craft beer 2.0 which is people choosing new styles in order to differentiate themselves from old farts like me um, in the way that I chose particular kinds of music 30 years ago to differentiate myself from my parents it's now happening in beer and it's more than beer. This is a, a really interesting point. Decisions in craft are driven by a much greater ownership and involvement in the category. It's not just I'm a fan of this beer, it's I've met the brewer, I've got the t-shirt, I've been to the brewery, I've been to an event, uh, I've, got, I've got their beer before anyone else in this country, I've got the limited edition. You'll notice how much, how narcissistic that sounds. That is, that is not an accident, that is, beer, beer Twitter, beer YouTube, it's all just incredibly, well, I'm the first person in the UK to get this limited edition because I swapped a bottle with somebody in Vermont and that kind of thing. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge degree of involvement, uh, which is why when Beavertown sold a minority stake, people felt personally betrayed. Uh, or their fans did. Um, this was a commercial business decision that the brewery took, but a lot of Beavertown fans had invested some kind of meaning into the brewery, above and beyond them being a brewer. They stood for a set of ideals and a set of values which some fans imagined they'd betrayed. And I don't think Beavertown ever promised to be that to those people, um, but they'd, they'd sort of inputted those values onto Beavertown and then felt let down by them uh, when, when they'd failed to live up to those values. Months later, Four Pure sold entirely, not just a matter of state, but the whole thing. People went, well, the Four Pure beers are very, very similar to Beavertown beers. But they didn't have the same emotional involvement uh, that Beavertown did, which created a massively different reaction among their closest fans. But they're, but they're very involved in beer. It helps define who they are. Another one on Casco Craft, I, I, looked, I looked through the Beer Town, the Beer City research, and uh, happily, I think, most of you describe your events as it's about celebrating beer in this particular town, this particular city. Good. I think that's how it should be. Uh, some of you talk about craft beer weeks, some of you have a big focus on, on real ale. But whatever you're doing, whether you're describing it as just beer or what, you're probably focusing on cask and or craft as, as the main beers that you're talking about, because these are the kind of beers you're going to be getting from local breweries and, and your, your, your focus is on local breweries. Uh, just a little bit about cask then is that, uh, which I think impacts later, is that a surprising number of people claim to drink cask beer uh, from research I did this summer. The majority of beer drinkers say they drink cask beer at some point. Most of them describe themselves as occasional cask drinkers. Now occasional can mean anything from once a month. It can mean, well, my mate Steve, he's really into his cask, so the once or twice a year that we're out drinking with Steve, when it's his round, we just tell him to get something interesting, and that's when I drink cask. It could be at Christmas I go home and I see my dad, and my dad drinks cask, so when I'm out drinking with my dad at Christmas, that's when I drink cask. So you can see people say, yes, I'm a cask drinker, and they might be drinking four or five pints of it a year. So if you've got drinkers like that who aren't rejecting cask, but are hardly drinking any of it, but call themselves cask drinkers, you only have to kind of sell them one or two more pints each, and you've got a massive uptick in, in cask volume. Um, I looked at the reasons why they're not drinking it more often than that. It's all about it's all this kind of vicious cycle of knowledge and quality. Uh, they go to a pub, they order a pint of cask, they don't like it. They don't know enough about it to know whether they don't like it because it's off, uh, if it's not conditioned properly, or whether it's just not for them. 
And so they go, you know what, to avoid doubt, I don't feel confident of taking it back because I don't know if it's off or not. Uh, so I'll just stick with San Miguel because I know where I am with that. Uh, so, so there's a massive opportunity to get those occasional drinkers to drink a bit more cask. Craft, on the other hand, uh, and, and the way these, the, the, this, and you really can't see this, I'm sorry, uh, but um, the meaning and significance of craft beer I found varied quite widely across the country. I've always argued against people who say that craft beer is a London thing. It's not. London was one of the last bits of the country to get craft beer. Uh, Fraserburgh in North Scotland got it you know, a long time before London did. Um, but I, I've always argued that craft is perhaps more of an, an urban thing. Uh, if you've got any city in the country that's got a good university population, uh, and a good infrastructure, you've probably got craft beer there. But what I found this summer is that even there it varies quite widely. Uh, so people in Manchester have a very different uh, perception than people in London. Uh, having been to Indian Man Beer Con last weekend, I thought Manchester was all over craft beer. It's really not. It's, it's a small minority and I think that's what you find in a lot of cities. For those people who do recognise it, what they tell me in focus groups is it's local and it's small and it's got a variety of flavours. But the key point is that for, for these people, there's a massive overlap with Cascale. Uh, they're the same thing. People talk to me, as, uh, people talk to me about Brewdog as a, as a, as a real ale brewer. Uh, Brewdog don't know any cask. They don't know that. As far as they're concerned, it's not mainstream lager. It, it's hoppy. Therefore, it, Cascale, craft beer, real ale, it's all the same thing, isn't it? And they're really, really not interested if you try to explain what the difference is, technically. By the way, just don't try. Um, uh, among some people, there's a feeling that craft beer is a reinvention of cask. It's the same beer presented in a different way. And, uh, and so it's just like, oh, well, there's the old stuff that my dad drank, but craft beer is the same beer, but with a really cool label on it. And, and that's for a lot of people, that's as far as it goes. I'm not agreeing with them, I'm not saying they're right, but if that's the perception, then you either challenge that perception or you talk to them in a way that makes sense with what they already think. Uh, drinkers occasionally want to try something different and flavourful, and so they go, right, I'm, I'm going to have an ale, I'm going to have one of those ales. Uh, and if you're not that experienced, you're going to have the one that looks more interesting and funky and colourful. So that's a kind of symbiotic relationship between cask and craft. Another bit of research uh, that was done earlier this year, in a, a uh, a project that Roger actually was slightly involved in was a, uh, a piece of research by a box steam brewery. And when people talk to me about craft and cask as opposites, uh, th this has become the most useful chart that I can find to prove them wrong. Uh, because there's a whole bunch of words that people use to describe craft beer, and there's a whole bunch of words that people use to describe real ale, whether they're drinkers or not. And some, a lot of the key, most important words are the same words. Uh, whether you're talking about craft or cask, it's about quality, it's about handmade, it's about diverse styles and flavours, it's about being different from the norm, and it's about being local. So you can talk about crafting, talk about cask, but we're talking about flavourful, locally produced, small scale beer. If you want to reach the widest possible audience, forget the distinction between cask and craft. Uh, this is what people are interested in. The people who are interested in, this is what drives their interest. So coming on to the, the beer city stuff, I think that kind of sets the scene. There's this big thing about local, a big thing about flavour, and a big need to create uh, events that people feel can be something tangible, something that they can get involved in, something they can experience, and it's got to kind of hit that standard for them to, to, to leave the house, basically. So, so how are beer cities fitting into that? Well, it's definitely a growing trend. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, I, I, is it, is it, Don, have you got 14? I think there's no? 14. Yeah, mm -hmm. I counted them up. And you can see... People it. take... Yeah. Yeah, you can see a, a massive uptick since since two, 2015. Basically, it's it's trebled in in three years. So this is a trend that's not gonna that's not gonna stop. There's certainly something uh, hugely attractive about this idea, and it's spreading through the country uh, like wildfire. How big are these events? Uh, pulling some of the stats together that you gave us. Uh, anywhere between one and twelve organisers. Uh, pulling the whole thing together, almost all of whom are volunteers and doing it for free. Anywhere between 10 and 200 different individual activities uh, within uh, a beer week event, uh, taking place in anywhere between 10 and 52 different venues, most of which are pubs, but, but not all. Uh, and I took the total number of activities uh, and crunched the numbers uh, between the number of organisers, uh, and on average, Per person involved in helping organise and run a beer week, each person is responsible for organising 22 different activities. 
Now, if you think of beer weeks as a lever in order to make something much bigger happen, this is an extraordinary uh, statistic, I think, uh, that for each person involved in organising your beer week, on average, you're creating 22 different events. That is a huge amount of activity to be doing. Uh, and I think that uh, this, this shows the kind of... Uh, the, the brilliant strength and genius of this kind of event because what you're doing is you're catalyzing something you're not having to go out and organize every single thing from scratch what you're doing is you're involving other people you're getting other people galvanized to do something so for the amount of work that you have to do you can create an extraordinary uh, amount of activity how are they financed? 70% uh, of you have sponsors, uh, but there's not that much money involved. Uh, payments from sponsors range from zero uh, to about 14,000, and, and the, the people that we, uh, I've, I've put IBD when I should have BID, but, but the presentation we had last night from the guy from uh, Norwich BID, uh, Norwich is the only beer week at the moment that has that level of investment. Although two beer weeks have total budgets of 20,000 plus, five beer weeks have no financing whatsoever, no budget whatsoever and yet you're still putting on all these events. Who's involved and in how? Well, pubs, as you would imagine, are the core. Uh, the average beer week has 34 different pubs involved in your activity. The average beer week has 12 different breweries involved. Uh, that varies quite widely depending on the size of the region. Uh, I, think, I think Norwich City of Ale uh, goes out to you know, quite a lot of East Anglia, whereas if you're, say, Manchester, then you're probably focused much more on kind of the city limits. Uh, in most cases, uh, you don't require any financial contribution from pubs or breweries, just the willingness to host or stage events or get involved in, in, in some way. Uh, and events are also taking place in bookshops, bottle shops, offline systems, market stalls, exhibition spaces and tourist attractions. Uh, Brighton had some great stuff uh, with uh, some beer events on Brighton Pier and also a beer tasting on a, was it a 737? Yeah, no, the I360 British show. Oh, the I360, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so a lot of imagination, uh, a lot of creativity, uh, and, and as I say, a lot of stuff happening from, uh, from the number of given the number of people involved. What works? Well, 90% of beer weeks uh, feature beers brewed specially for the event. Uh, most of the time these are unique collaborations, one-off beers. Speaking directly back to that trend of something experiential, something one-off, I can't get this anywhere else any other time. Meet the Brewer and Tutor Tasting events uh, seem to have the most success in terms of attendance and in terms of coverage, uh, especially if done with a twist, like on the i360, uh, or, or if someone tries to talk about beer and music matching or something like that. Um, beer festivals, ale trails, and beer and food matching dinners all seem to be universally successful as well. So there's quite a broad palette of events uh, to choose from, with, with some obvious ones at the core, but they do seem to work very well. And feedback, very few people got any kind of hard quantitative data, but 90% uh, of you say that there's an uplift in pub visits during the event. 80% say there's evidence people enjoyed it, which is reassuring. 70% uh, say people will return in future years. And 80% say the city's reputation for beer and pubs has been enhanced. Now, I think this is mostly anecdotal uh, rather than sort of hard figures, but those are really, really encouraging uh, sort of stats. So where do you go from here? Um, yesterday, uh, in the morning advertiser, there was this story that uh, a new study uh, by uh, local governments shows that uh, pubs, bars and restaurants will save the high streets. 92% of councils say that pubs, bars and restaurants are vital for the future of the high street. The high street is under attack, it's being diminished. So councils think that pubs are going to save the high street. This puts pub, but yet pubs are declining. So, what we're going to do about that? You need to help support pubs. And this gives us a very, very powerful logic behind beer weeks. So, what we've established is occasional pub visitors need experiential events to go to the pub more often, and local interest is increasingly important, both in, in beer and beyond. This means that beer weeks which are unique experiential events and have a unique special local focus are hugely attractive because beer weeks drive people to pubs which we've established and save the pub save the high street this gives you an incredibly strong case to go to uh, councils and to other organizations for support you are driving people to pubs and pubs are keeping high streets alive so how do we grow from, from where we are at the moment? Um, 
I think the first point has to be funding, and I'm, I'm sure this is what many people are thinking at the back of, back of their minds. I've, I've got experience myself organising events on no budget uh, and no income, and it, it's a grind, and we all need to pay our, our rent or our mortgage. Um, most of you are voluntary. I think you need to be looking at some way in which you can reward yourselves financially. <coughs> Otherwise, eventually you run out of energy, you run out of money. That's what happened with London Beer City. Uh, Will Hawkes just said, I've put four months of my life into it and it was brilliant and I have not got a penny from it and I can't, simply cannot afford to do that. Um, there are lots of places you can go for funding and uh, uh, we, we had some talks on that last night. Uh, I think that um, having been involved as I say, uh, if you go for funding applications to bodies who give grants out, try and find somebody who uh, is experienced in filling out those uh, forms because there's a knack to it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, there's, a, there's a way that you have to fill in a form which is basically repeating back to them what they're saying in the question. Will you, will you, what, what, what outcomes will, you, will this uh, produce? This will produce several outcomes. Outcomes, use the word outcomes as often as, as, you, as you possibly can. <laughs> they love that word. Um, but, but, but there is a knack, there is a formula for filling in these, these, these kind of forms. So if you can share information with people who've successfully achieved uh, some kind of funding would be really interesting. Local councils, uh, if local councils are telling you that the high street uh, is under threat and pubs are going to um, save it, you've got a story to open doors there uh, with, with the information you've already got and future information. Yeah, they should be supporting you. They may well not support you financially, but they can support you by giving you uh, free publicity, uh, by giving you uh, venues uh, and, and things like that, by letting you use a town hall or whatever. Uh, we run, my wife and I run the Stoke Newton Literary Festival in North London. Uh, the council doesn't give us a penny, uh, but they do give us an office. Uh, above the library, which would otherwise be empty. It's no skin off their nose, uh, but that office gives us stability and a base and somewhere to keep all our plastic glasses and, and things like that. <laughs> Uh, your local camera, we heard from uh, Tom uh, last night, um, you know, you've got a camera branch, whether you know them or not, whether they're, there, whether they're enthusiastic or not, there is a branch near you uh, and they can give you all sorts and Tom last night was saying that even if you get a cold shoulder from an initial approach, go and talk to him because uh, they should be involved. Local press, we also heard last night, uh, local press are desperate for local stories. Uh, and Asia and I were talking at the back last night, uh, while the guy from the Eastern Daily Press was talking, if you can craft a well-written press release, uh, chances are they'll just put it in. They'll just, they'll just copy and paste it into the, into the paper, because you're giving them content. And because people, and I was thinking about this during the talk last night, that not everyone reads local press, but if you do read local press, by definition, you're interested in local events. And so here you are, here's some information about a local event, something new, something special, something different that's happening locally. Local beer writers. Uh, I don't know how many uh, of you uh, have used beer writers in your, uh, in your events so far. Uh, I get invited to a couple of, personally, a couple of beer week uh, events every, every year. Had a great time in, uh, in Norfolk and in uh, Nottingham uh, this year. Um, but not just kind of the high profile people like me and Adrian, you have local beer writers. And if you go to the Guild of British Beer Writers website, every single member of the Guild is listed on that website with their address and their contact details. Go on there, find out who your local beer writers are. They'd be delighted to hear from you and delighted to help in any way they can. Uh, we are talking at the moment in the Guild about setting up local hubs uh, so we can, can focus on activity outside London because inevitably it is a bit London centric. Social media is, is vital. Um, and there's obviously a knack to using it. Uh, my wife lives with the Stoke Newton Literary Festival. She, she tweets from a Stoke Lit Fest account. Uh, and she's made that account one of like the top local accounts. Uh, she's uh, sort of followed everybody who does local news updates and that kind of thing, local press, so they follow her back. She comments on local issues, if there's a, if there's a thing happening local, if someone's lost a cat, if someone's trying to sell, you know, she retweets that for them. So, so the, the, the activity on the Stoke Newton Literary Festival Twitter is not just around the festival itself, it's all year round. And so the festival's become seen as a local hub, uh, a, a local kind of information sharing place. Now if you do that with your Twitter account, keep it going throughout the year, any 
local beer news that's coming up, anything relevant, any pub promotion, anything like that, just make sure that all the local pubs, all local beer enthusiasts are following you and you've got them on a full-time relationship. Things are going to be so much easier when you then come around to organising or publicising your next event. And that leads you to quantitative data. If you've got kind of several thousand Twitter followers, then after the uh, event is over, it costs you nothing to put together a Survey Monkey questionnaire uh, and ask them how they enjoyed the event, uh, what was good about it, what could, what could be improved. And you can get some positive stats that then the following year you can take back to people. If you get into Survey Monkey enough, you can start to put filters on it like that. So you can say, well, men enjoyed it like this, but women enjoyed these aspects more, or uh, we appealed to this many young people and this many older people, and start to segment that data. And then that gives you stories that you can go back with uh, to, uh, to kind of, whether it's get more funding, get more interest, get more engagement uh, from various parties. And I think that's it. Yes. Thank you very much.